Okay, hi guys. So I'm just going to go through a quick uh, video of my workflow for making kind of 2.5D cam uh, that I've discovered through trial and error. CNC is not my strong point. So uh, here's what I found. So basically the first thing you want to do is go to Inkscape.com, download Inkscape. It's an open source uh, vector graphics program. And uh, what you want to do is create an SWG, which is a, or SVG, sorry, which is a vector graphics file of whatever you're going to do. So I just did some text. Um, this is something my boss says constantly because I work in IS. And um, uh, so I just used the text tool, made the text, and then went to path, object to path, and converted it into vectors. So you can see this is all in vectors. Um, and then you'll save it off as an SVG. Uh, so the next thing, and you want to, if you if you care about dimensional accuracy, you can do it in here and it'll actually uh, import it dimensionally accurately into MakerCam. So the next thing you want to do is go to MakerCam. Let's spell it right, MakerCam.com. And uh, so this is a web-based uh, G-code generator. Uh, first thing you're going to do is edit your preferences. And since we're coming from Inkscape, this uh, default resolution has to be 90. Um, the rest of the stuff you can fill out. It doesn't seem to matter all that much, to be honest, because it doesn't really truncate your dimensions anyway. Uh, but uh, so we'll go 0.01 and we'll hit OK. And uh, so what we'll do is import or open our SVG file. Here's our SVG file. And you can see it down here. It always imports it sort of down by the origin. Uh, and we'll switch this over to centimeters. So coming in from uh, from Inkscape, this is about one, two, three and a half centimeters. I want it roughly double that. I know from past experience, I actually want it 220% of that. So I'm going to do this, and it's going to scale it up, and then I'm going to grab all of this stuff and move it up to my origins here. Uh, so there it is. So now the next thing you're going to want to do is to create your tool paths. Um, and there's a couple ways to do this. Uh, if you're worried about workflow efficiency, what you want to do is make a different tool path for each, oops, uh, undo that move for each letter. Uh, and then you can determine that it mills this letter, that letter, that letter, that letter in order. Otherwise, if you select the whole thing, which is what I'm going to do, uh, and make a tool path, it's still the same, except it like jumps around. Mine did the A and the N first, and then the Y, and then the R, something like that. So it's not very efficient. Uh, but it works fine if you don't care about how long it takes. So we're going to go to pocket operation. So profile mills around the outside. Pocket mills out the middle of, of the spaces, and follow path just puts the tool right on this line and follows it around. Uh, so we'll do a pocket operation. My tool diameter is an eighth of an inch, which is 3.17 millimeters. My target depth, so I'm just doing kind of an engraving thing, so I'm going to go minus 0.75 millimeters. Safety height is two. This is the height that it goes up above the piece to traverse. If you're attaching with tape like I am, it can be pretty low, like two millimeters. Uh, if you're using clamps, it should be above your clamps, obviously. Um, the bigger you make this, the uh, longer the file or it's going to take to go because the z-axis is pretty slow. Um, step over is fine at 40. Step down, I'm just going to do minus 0.75. So this is going to do the whole thing in one operation. If I was doing like a millimeter and a half, I could do 0.75 and it would do two passes. Uh, ref and clearance, don't care. Feed rate, I'm going to drop this to 800 and plunge rate to 400. Um, I'm still messing with settings. I've only done a couple pieces of wood. So um, in foam, this doesn't really matter. You can basically drag the tool through foam as fast as it'll go. Uh, in wood, it matters more. And uh, counterclockwise is my bit. I'll hit OK. And now it's shaded this, so it knows what to do. The last thing I'm going to do is actually calculate the tool path. So it's going to take a minute. And so here are the actual paths the tool is going to take. Uh, if we zoom in on this, you can see that it looks like all of the letters are uh, represented properly. If you make it like if you have it too small, for example, this middle of the H would get lost. There wouldn't be a path in here and you would know that you're just going to get two bars with a little kind of ziggy on each side, but you're not actually going to get the middle. So you want to scale it and make sure that the paths are correct. Um, each of these little green arrows is a lift uh, and transfer to a different spot. If you have something where it 
like these, for example, I could probably make this a little bit smaller and get rid of these little hogs if I was really concerned with, and like these ones, if I was really concerned with every little thing, but I'm not, um, this is fine. So the last thing to do is go to cam and export G code. You want to select your tool path. If you did your letters individually and named them, uh, you would go W H E R. You could move them up and down and then uh, get them in order and then export the tool path. And so I'm just going to call this test.nc. Going to replace it. Yes. Uh, -huh. so that's that. So now our G code is exported. What we're going to do now is go into the fab UI. Um, and so now I'm logging into the machine and what we need to do is kind of massage the G code a little bit so the, uh, the fab totem can understand it. So the first thing we're going to do is go to object manager. This is just kind of an, this, I call it a subtractive test. This is where I'm just using all my subtractive test stuff. This is a previous one. So I'm going to delete it. And, uh, now I'm going to add the one that I just made. So we're going to go test.nc. Okay. Save. And then we're going to go in and edit it. Uh, so there are a couple things. The fab totem doesn't recognize all of the G codes that maker cam tries to use. Um, so we're going to strip out a bunch of the stuff. For example, the G90 we need, that's the absolute, but the other two we don't. Um, this T0 M6 is tooling commands that we don't care about. G17 is some planar command we don't care about. And then we have to add the speed that we want the fab to spin at, um, cause it doesn't have automatic feed rate, uh, calculation. So I'm going to go 2000, I think is what I used, uh, something like that. Um, you can play around with these and then way down at the bottom, this is the bugaboo. This M5 and M30 are not needed. The fab adds them automatically. And if you have that M5 in there, it really screws things up. And then the last thing Marco recommended putting in a G27, this will send it home before it runs the M5 to turn off the tool. So this makes sure that everything finishes, the fab goes home and then the tool turns off. Uh, so that's good. So we'll save that. Um, and so from here, we, if we wanted to run it, we would go to print. The one thing that I've found is what you want to do is go to jog and use these step commands, the Z step and the step and the over and, and Z up and down to get the tool right to your zero point before you go into create. And I'll show you why. So if I didn't do this and I go to create and I'm going to take my subtractive test and I want my test.nc. So here it'll give you the dimensions, how long it thinks it's going to take, etc. It seems to undershoot. It usually takes like maybe 10% longer than it thinks it will on printing and, and subtractive stuff. And we'll hit next and we're ready. So now it's going to run some checks on the door and the bed and whatnot. Um, and do, 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 we get the nice little spinny circle. It doesn't take too long. Actually, it seems pretty quick. Um, continue and so right here it says set origin right and you can see it gives me the same jog kind of console except there's no way to set the detents right there's no way to set how much it moves and it's it's just a set amount and the z i think is like five millimeters or something so uh, i found that this is not accurate enough to really get a good zero um, so what i do is i use the jog i set it exactly where i want and then when i get to this page i just say where i'm at is zero and I hit print. And then from there, it will run the program. And I will show you, uh, I haven't got it set up right now. So I'm going to set it up and then I'm going to take some video of it milling and then I'll take a video of the finished product. Uh, and that will be what I show you guys. Thanks. Okay, so this is basically where we left off in the screen cap video. Um, what I've done is I have placed my block of wood uh, on there and I've actually zeroed, I've used the jog function to zero the cutter uh, on my origin point. This is important because if you, you'll see here, so if I hit continue, um, it's going to say set origin, but it doesn't give me any uh, jog 
uh, any control over how far it jogs, um, and it goes in pretty big chunks, so you won't be able to get a good origin. So you have to use the jog function to set it, and then just uh, click this to say that it's at the origin, and hit print. So now what we'll do is we'll see, and it's gonna start running my G code. Um, so there it spools up, it's gonna traverse over. Let's see if we can get a better shot from here. Uh, and there we go, so it's starting to mill out, I believe, the pocket on the A. Um, and it follows well, the uh, speed is constant. Everything seems to be working really well, so I'm super pleased with it. So uh, I'll shoot another video of the finished product and we'll be good to go. All right, and just to finish up, here's the finished piece. You can see it's all kind of hairy. I have a feeling my speeds and feeds could be better, but it did work. Uh, it did exactly what I told it to. Now it's just a matter of me telling it the right thing. So uh, thanks for watching.